I'm glad you've joined me today to talk about evangelism to Muslims. As the church, we don't just do evangelism training in order to learn something new or to develop skill in a new method, but we have real people in mind, people who desperately need to hear the good news of Jesus and to know the love of Christ. So we train that we may more effectively communicate the gospel with people that God loves, that the name of Christ would be exalted above every name. We pray to our Father in heaven, the creator of all people in each of these people groups, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. May by your grace and good pleasure, many people from each of these groups, tribes, and languages cry out in the knowledge of Christ. Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. May we who know you worship by saying blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. There are approximately 25 million Muslims in China. That's about 1.7% of the population of China. The largest Muslim people groups in China are the Hui, the Uyghur, Kazakh, and Dongxiang. The Hui make up about 46% of Muslims in China, and the Uyghurs, 41%. And the Hui, the Hui, many Hui have not yet heard the good news of Jesus Christ. There are only about 0.01% of Hui people who know Christ. So I ask that beginning today that you would join me and pray frequently that Chinese Muslims among these distinct people groups would hear the gospel and surrender to Christ. Rather than trying to earn their salvation with good works through Islam. And pray that the Spirit would spread and multiply the gospel among Muslim families and villages, resulting in new life and better hope in Christ. In Taiwan, there are around 60,000 Muslims, about 0.3% of the population. The majority of Taiwanese Muslims belong to the Hui ethnic minority group also, and there are also more than 180,000 foreign Muslims working in Taiwan from countries such as Indonesia and Malaysia. There are 11 mosques in Taiwan. Uh, you might have seen one. You might have seen this one, the largest and oldest mosque in Taiwan, the Taipei Grand Mosque. Now before we dive into any three, let's take a minute to pray for Muslims in Taiwan and China as well as for ourselves in the church to be Christ's witnesses without fear, but rather with power, love, and sound judgment. Lord Jesus, you saved us and called us for your own purpose. The gospel is good news for all people. Help us to share the good news with our friends, family, and neighbors, yes, but also with people from these Muslim groups. May we not rely on our own power, but on your power. And may we not be ashamed about the testimony about our Lord. In the spirit that you give, of power, love, and sound judgment, send us out to be your witnesses. And Lord, send brothers and sisters among us to Muslim people groups 
that they may hear and receive your word. Call on you for forgiveness and salvation and be saved. Amen. Any three is an approach to sharing the gospel which was developed by Mike Shipman and his missionary team in Southeast Asia several years ago. Mike had spent several years of relatively fruitless ministry, but then after changing his approach and using this kind of approach, he discovered that the people that they thought were resistant to the gospel were actually quite receptive. After seven years, they saw tremendous fruit by using this evangelism approach. He said, more than 5,000 Muslims have professed faith in Jesus Christ through any three style evangelism. We're seeing believers and churches reproduce in multiplying generations. But we also recognize that many people have labored for years in Muslim lands without seeing any conversions. But we will commit to serving the Lord joyfully with faith and trust the fruit of the harvest to Him. Now Mike Shipman is very clear about this. The power is in the gospel, not the method. So in this training today, know that the practical tools are only for the purpose that more people may hear the good news of Jesus Christ. The point is this, the method isn't what really matters, what matters is sharing the gospel. And that's what I want to encourage us to do more of today. From here on, the training that I present is taken from Mike Shipman's training. I learned this material from Mike several years ago, and today I have the privilege of passing it on to you. And we begin by opening our Bibles to examine Jesus' evangelism encounter with the woman at the well in John chapter 4. So pull out your Bible or open it up on your computer screen and get ready to follow along with me as I read the story. But before I begin, I just want to say that the main point of John chapter 4, just like the main point of the whole book of John, is not to give us practical tips or to give us a model to follow. It isn't uh, in our Bibles here primarily to show us how to evangelize. The main point is to show us Jesus, the Christ, the giver of living water, the giver of eternal life. That's what this chapter is about. And yet, we can recognize that in this story is a learning experience for the disciples. They're learning about who Jesus is, for sure, but they're also learning about how he talks with people. He's training them to be laborers in the harvest, as we will see. The disciples, they needed motivation more than method, probably, and we are the same today. Jesus provides his disciples in John chapter 4 with both a motivation and a model, and so he teaches us why to witness and how to witness. In Jesus' life and ministry, he witnessed all kinds of people. He witnessed to the, the rich and the poor, the influential and the common, Jews and Gentiles, men and women. He witnessed in a variety of contexts. He witnessed in uh, synagogues and in the temple, along the beach, on the mountain, on the road, in a boat. And he witnessed during any time of the day, morning, noon, evening, night. He witnessed anytime, anywhere, to anyone. And that's where we get the name for this training, this, this approach, any three. 
teaching us how to, to witness uh, any time, anywhere, to anyone. Follow along with me as I read John chapter 4, verse 1 through 8. When Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard he was making and baptizing more disciples than John, though Jesus himself was not baptizing, but his disciples were, he left Judea and went again to Galilee. He had to travel through Samaria. So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar near the property that Jacob had given his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, worn out from his journey, sat down at the well. It was about noon. A woman of Samaria came to draw water. Give me a drink, Jesus said to her, because his disciples had gone into the town to buy food. Now in these first seven verses, we, we see the setting of the story, uh, the who, where, when, and what. And the who, when, where, and what in the story, they're pretty unique and exceptional. Uh, if there is a very specific time of day. Um, John tells us what time it was, about noon. A very specific person, a Samaritan woman, a place, the well outside of town, and, and the situation, Jesus resting, and the woman coming to draw water. And what Jesus modeled in this story gives us a picture of what spontaneous any three evangelism looks like. It could be anywhere, at any time, and with anyone. Now this doesn't mean everyone all the time, everywhere, but it does mean that in non-formal contexts, in normal, everyday situations, there are opportunities for gospel encounters. Let's continue the story, in, starting back in verse 7 and reading through to 26. A woman of Samaria came to draw water. Give me a drink, Jesus said to her, because his disciples had gone into town to buy food. How is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a Samaritan woman, she asked him. For Jews do not associate with Samaritans, Jesus answered. If you knew the gift of God and who was saying to you, give me a drink, you would ask him and he would give you living water. Sir, said the woman, you don't even have a bucket and the well is deep. So where do you get this living water? You aren't greater than our father Jacob, are you? He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and livestock. Jesus said, everyone who drinks from him this water will get thirsty again. But whoever drinks from the water that I will give him will never get thirsty again. In fact, the water I will give him will become a well of water springing up in him for eternal life. Sir, the woman said to him, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and come here to draw water. Go call your husband, he told her, and come back here. I don't have a husband, she answered. You've correctly said I don't have a husband, Jesus said, for you've had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. What you've said is true. Sir, the woman replied, I see that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews say that the place to worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus told her, Believe me, woman, an hour is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we know because salvation is from the Jews. But an hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Yes, the Father wants such people to worship Him. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said to Him, I know that the Messiah is coming, who is called the Christ. When He comes, He will explain everything to us. Jesus told her, I... The one speaking to you am he. 
Now in this story, we're going to look at five characteristics of Jesus' approach as he talks with this Samaritan woman. And the first is that Jesus' witnessing was intentional. Jesus intentionally went through Samaria on his journey back to Galilee. Though there could have been an alternate route back to Galilee that would enable him and his disciples to avoid contact with the Samaritans. But they chose to go by this route and to go through Samaria. Jesus was intentional in staying behind when the rest of the disciples went to gather food. Maybe he was thinking there would be an opportunity such as this. In any case, Jesus was prepared to share the gospel. When an opportunity came, he was ready for it. He was prepared to share the gospel with whoever he might encounter. The application for us is this. We need to be prepared to share the gospel and to be intentional in our conversations. We need to put ourselves in places where we will encounter unbelievers with the intention of sharing the gospel with them. The second characteristic of Jesus' witnessing is that Jesus' witnessing was informal. It occurred just in the course of everyday life. It, it wasn't in the, the setting of a, a synagogue with, a, with formal preaching. It was, it was just more natural in conversation. And for us, our evangelism doesn't require a setup. It can be natural in just everyday life situations. The third characteristic is that Jesus' witnessing was interactive. As we read through this story, it's obvious that there's a dialogue going on here, that the style is very conversational. It starts with a very relaxed tone, and, and Jesus responds to the woman. The woman responds to Jesus. Uh, he's asking questions, and, and she's giving some answers. And he doesn't argue, but they go back and forth. Jesus says something, she says something. Jesus says something, she says something. It doesn't, it doesn't get tense um, too early, and Jesus isn't, isn't preachy. Um, the application is for us, let's let, our, let's let our witnessing conversations progress um, in a conversational, natural tone. Let's not get preachy and argumentative in our witnessing. And remember this very important point, that, that you're not alone when you're talking with an unbeliever, but, but Jesus is present with you. The Holy Spirit is the third person in the conversation. He is there. He will draw and convict. The next characteristic is that Jesus' witnessing took initiative. We'll notice right from the beginning that it's Jesus who started the conversation. Jesus said the first word, give me a drink. And Jesus also guided the conversation with how he asked questions, leading her in the conversation. He was direct when he presented truth, and he spoke as one with authority, but still using an interactive teaching approach. Finally, Jesus' witnessing uh, was characterized by introduction of the Messiah. Jesus witnessed by introducing the Messiah. Through their dialogue, we can see that the, the woman's understanding of Jesus progressed. At the beginning, all the woman knew about Jesus was that he was a Jewish man. 
Later on, she supposed that he might be a great man, maybe even greater than Jacob. A few sentences later, she guesses that he is a prophet. And finally, she comes to recognize that he is the Messiah. Now, the goal in our witnessing conversations is the same, is to help people understand that Jesus is Savior, and, and it can happen through this, this gradual, pro, this gradual um, process. Uh, the woman understood Jesus from Jewish man to perhaps greater than Jacob to a prophet to Messiah. Ultimately, we want the people we're sharing with to know that Jesus is God incarnate, sent to the world to save sinners by atoning who sins his, uh, by his sacrificial death, and that he rose from the dead, and that this is the proof that God received his sacrifice. This is the Messiah we want to introduce people to. So to review, from this story we see that Jesus' wish, witnessing approach was intentional and formal, interactive. He took initiative and he introduced himself as the Messiah. Well, let's look at the steps that Jesus took. If we were to model out Jesus' witnessing approach, what, what steps would we see? Uh, first, he spent time getting connected with the woman. He established some commonality. Now, this is the first objective in developing a witnessing conversation, is getting connected with the person. And uh, this is more than just sm small talk. It's not just talking about the weather, but it's intentional and direct. And Jesus, when he opened up by asking the woman for a drink, he did this with a purpose. Now, there's, there's a common myth that, um, that we don't have all that much in common with many people, but Jesus dispels that myth by showing us that there are certain things that are common to all people, and these are basic human needs, such as thirst. And so he uses this commonality of both needing water as a way to relate to the woman and to get connected. And so we find a point of contact with a, with a person first. This, the second step is that Jesus, he, he got to spiritual matters. He transitioned the conversation away from earthly things to, to spiritual things. He started off talking about well water, but he didn't stay on that topic. He, he moved from well water to living water. So water he's using as an analogy to bridge to the gospel. And because they were talking about well water, and now they're talking about spiritual water, this really sparked the interest in the woman to know more. And so I would advise you in this step not to, not to rush it, not to rush into the gospel, but to, um, but this step is just about uh, bringing up spiritual things and transitioning the interactive, informal conversation to talk about spiritual matters such as faith and religion and God. But we don't stay there. In step three, Jesus revealed her sin and its effects. He did this by saying, go call your husband back here. And Jesus, knowing the background of the woman, this, this really opened up the conversation to her, um, her past sins. Now, when we witness to people, we should, we should bring up the general problem of all mankind. Jesus revealed the heart of the woman's problem in order to reveal the cure. Now, people, need 
to admit their sinfulness before receiving salvation. So this is a crucial step. Most people will admit the reality of sin, even personal sin, uh, but then when we ask a follow-up question, what are you doing to get your sins forgiven? This, this real, reveals that as humans, we're, we're really ineffective at dealing with our sin on our own. So this is a crucial step. And then in step four, Jesus presented himself as the Messiah. Here he's, he's making a distinction between the misunderstanding in the woman's belief and the true way of salvation. So uh, they're talking a little bit about uh, some, some of the things that the woman is focused on, and she sees that the location of worship is, is important. This is how you worship, is getting the location right. But Jesus is correcting her misunderstanding to, to focus on the how we worship in spirit and in truth. So after from finding some common ground first and stressing commonality, now, now he's showing the differences and highlighting the true gospel. This is the true gospel that's the only solution for her sins. Finally, Jesus invited her to re receive himself and arrange, arrange follow-up. He invited her to go get her husband, and then when she went to tell the other people in the town, he stayed there two more days just teaching and talking with people and introducing himself to people, and I imagine teaching the woman also to grow in uh, discipleship. So since, since Jesus was so he pursued Jesus pursued this kind of follow-up. Jesus desired reaching beyond the woman with the gospel. He wanted to introduce a group to the Messiah. Now, if a person like the woman is open, they'll want to know more about how their sins can be forgiven. Now, after sharing the gospel, ask if there's any questions. Ask if they, be if they believe, um, and if they're not ready, then be prepared to tell more or plan for a follow-up to, to share more. But what we just studied in part one of the story is the how of witnessing in conversational evangelism. And next, in, in part two of our story, Jesus teaches the disciples the why of evangelism. In, in this part, he motivates his disciples, including us, for the work of the harvest. So follow along with me as I read verses 27 through 42. Just then his disciples arrived, and they were amazed that he was talking with a woman. Yet no one said, mm, what do you want, or why are you talking with her? Then the woman left her water jar, went into town, and told the people, Come, see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? They left the town and made their way to him. In the meantime, the disciples kept urging him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said, I have food to eat that you don't know about. The disciples said to one another, Could someone have brought him something to eat? My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Jesus told them, Don't you say there are still four more months and then comes the harvest? Listen to what I'm telling you. Open your eyes and look at the fields because they are ready for harvest. The reaper is already receiving pay and gathering fruit for eternal life so that the sower and reaper can rejoice together. For in this case the saying is true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap what you didn't labor for. Others have labored, and you have benefited from their labor. Now many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of what the woman said when she testified, he told me everything I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. Many more believed because of what he said. And they told the woman, We no longer believe because of what you said, since we have heard for ourselves and know that this really is the Savior of the world. Uh, 
Now, Jesus motivates his disciples in this section. And the first thing that I'd like to point out is that Jesus taught his disciples the passion for the harvest. And we see that in verses 27 through 34. Jesus was passionate about witnessing. He, he loved sharing about the good news with this woman. And, and, and how do we know about that? Because, because he wasn't concerned with food anymore. Even though he was tired and hungry and he needed food, and yet after this encounter he felt full and satisfied. Now, this is, this is not like the disciples' response at all. They showed no passion for evangelism. And uh, they were instead more concerned about food that they had brought than about Jesus talking with this woman about the living water. They were more concerned with getting Jesus to eat the food they brought than about hearing a report about this evangelism encounter and this woman repenting and believing in him. Jesus enjoyed witnessing more than eating. Do you love to witness? Or is your desire for, for worldly pleasure stronger and have more control on you and uh, give you more passion than your desire to spread the gospel? Secondly, Jesus taught his disciples the pressure of the harvest. Look again in verse 35 when he says, don't you, don't you say there are still four more months and then comes the harvest? Listen to what I'm telling you. Open your eyes and look at the fields because they're ready for harvest. Jesus is teaching his disciples that the time is now to witness. There's a pressure and urgency in the harvest. Reality is that every day untold thousands of people are perishing without hearing the gospel. The time is now. We need to be about the work of sharing the gospel. Maybe you know someone who needs to receive salvation in through Christ Jesus. Now, how, how long do you typically know somebody uh, as a friend before you start sharing the gospel with them? Let's not wait. Let's not wait any longer. There is a pressure of the harvest. Next, Jesus taught his disciples of the payment of the harvest. In verse 36, Jesus says, The reaper is already receiving pay and gathering fruit for eternal life, so that the sower and reaper can rejoice together. The payment of the harvest brings great joy to both the sower and the reaper. Now, one primary wage for the harvester is the fruit of the harvest, itself. The fruit is, is the reward itself. And maybe you've, you've seen people uh, accept the gospel and move from death to, to life. And doesn't that just give you incredible joy at being a part of that and leading them to accept Christ? Well, that should, that should motivate us to witness. We see God's glory manifest. This, the harvest brings joy to us. It, it brings joy to heaven too. Now, wouldn't that encourage you and bring you joy to be more effective uh, at witnessing and harvesting the, the fruit? So we should be expecting God uh, to do great things and for Him to bring salvation. Next, Jesus taught his disciples the pattern of the harvest. Moving on to verses 37 and 38, Jesus says, For in this case the saying is true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap what you didn't labor for. Others have labored, and you have benefited from their labor. So G Jesus is teaching his disciples that the pattern of the harvest is both sowing and reaping. Now, Jesus did both, sowing and reaping. And the time now is the time for both. Not just sowing the gospel, um, but, but, but harvesting. Harvesting is reaping. 
Um, so the goal is never just sowing. The application for us is when you witness, do you, do you leave it there right after you've shared the gospel um, uh, about Jesus' death and resurrection? Or do you invite people to respond, invite people to uh, receive the Word of God and to receive eternal life? This is, this is drawing the net in witnessing, and this is the pattern of the harvest. Finally, Jesus taught his disciples the potential of the harvest. And see what happens in verse 39 through 42. The Samaritans from that town believed in him because of what the woman said when she testified, he told me everything I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed two more days, and many more believed because of what he said. And they told the woman, we no longer believe because of what you said, since we've heard for ourselves and know that this really is the Savior of the world. And when Jesus stayed two more days, um, this, was, this was a worthwhile investment. And it ended up that not just the one woman who he talked with initially believed in him, but many people in the town. Now consider the analogy of a, of a watermelon. How many seeds does a watermelon have? Maybe 300, 400. What are they good for? Why are they there? What are they there for in, the, in that watermelon? What's their purpose? It's to produce more watermelon plants that produce more watermelons. One watermelon has seeds already inside it to plant multiple new watermelon plants and to produce multiple new watermelons. So this is a picture of the potential of the harvest, the potential for multi-generational multiplication. This is kind of like the woman. The woman, she received the word from Jesus and immediately witnessed to her friends. And her witness led to many in Samaria believing. She's, she's calling her friends to meet Jesus. And through this one woman, many met him. So to review, Christ motivates his disciples to witness in this passage in John 4, 27 through 42 by teaching his disciples the passion for the harvest, the pressure of the harvest, the payment of the harvest, the pattern of the harvest, and the potential of the harvest. And as the church, we, we do need to train ourselves uh, to witness well with intentionality, and, uh, and with, with clarity, and also with concern for people. Uh, but, but perhaps more important than developing our skills in, in, in actually uh, doing the witnessing and sharing with people, perhaps more important than that is developing our hearts to feel both the urgency and the joy of witnessing for Christ. And to do that, we need to pray. We need to devote ourselves to pray. Pray for our hearts to have passion for the harvest. Yes, pray for our skills and training too. Pray for our actions and the words and the conversation and the results and our work to sow the gospel widely. Colossians 4, 2 through 4 says, Devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. And pray for us too, that God may open a door for our message, so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. And John 6.44 also says, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them, and I will raise them up at the last day. Now, in these several verses, we find reason for three types of prayer. Gospel opportunities are open to us by God. Our ability to evangelize, clearly, it comes from God. And people, souls, they're drawn to Jesus by God. So we pray 
regularly for these three types of opens. Ask God to open the door for the gospel. Ask God to open our mouths to proclaim the gospel. And ask God to open their hearts to receive the gospel. Now, the application uh, is, is to pray regularly for these three op opens because we need God's help to change our hearts, giving us passion and, and, also, um, and also giving us the ability to share the gospel clearly and effectively with love for God and concern for people. Uh, how do we work to develop a passion for the harvest? Well, yeah, one way is to pray regularly for, um, for witnessing work and also for the lost and unreached. Another way to develop a passion for the harvest is get out into the harvest. Go to the places where the lost are. Hang out with the lost. Uh, go to the mosques, go to the Muslim shops and restaurants and noodle sh shops. Um, see the Muslims in how they practice Islam uh, as they're giving worship to something that's false. It may stir a passion in us to see them know our Savior. And finally, be intentional about each conversation. Uh, this, this training is about getting equipped and getting prepared so that when we have opportunities, we may take them with intentionality. Next, we're going to go over practical steps. Uh, these are the practical aspects and tips of the Any 3 approach. In Mike Shipman's material, he has some very specific sentences that someone can just memorize and go from step to step in a conversation. Uh, transitions to go from step one to two and two to three and so on. I like to think that before step one, there is a state zero which, in which contact has not yet been initiated. Uh, for some people like me, going from step zero to step one is often the hardest step. The only way to go from zero to step one is just to start talking. So one tip that I personally have found really helpful is to start with the F topics. These are topics like food and family and, and festivals. These are topics that relate to everyone. And generally, everyone enjoys talking about these topics. Uh, what food do you like? What food did you have for dinner? Uh, who's in your family? And festivals is a very easy way to transition into spiritual matters, whether it be talking about uh, Qingmingjie or about Ramadan or about Christmas. The goal here is to build rapport in the first three to five minutes. The second step finds a bridge from non-spiritual topics to spiritual topics. Here we transition to talking about faith, religion, and God. Now, one way to do this is to follow the F topics. Now, there's one more. Once food, family, and festivals have been discussed, move on to faith. Um, another somewhat direct way is to simply ask the question, so, are you Hindu, Muslim, Buddhist, Christian? What religion are you? And it doesn't need to be a smooth transition, but it should follow after step one, after you've established a connection with the person. In step three, we're going to bring up the problem of sin, noting first that this is a problem that all religions need to deal with. To transition from step one to step two, you could say, uh, most all religions are alike, aren't they? We all want to please God. We all want to try to get into heaven. Between our religions, we all have a, a lot of things in common. You could say that. And then say, we're all sinners, aren't we? This, this is establishing the, the commonality. We're all sinners, aren't we? Ask the question, what are you doing to try to get rid of 
uh, your sins? What are you doing to get your sins forgiven? Are your sins paid off yet? When will they be paid off? And then let the person respond to the question. Typically, a person might say that you're trying to do good or, to, or trying to be a good Muslim. In step four, we share how the gospel provides the only solution for the problem of sin. Here's how we transition. After sin has been discussed, say, well, what I believe is different from that. I know that my sins are forgiven, but it's not because I'm a good person. Of course, I try to be a good person. I know that my sins are forgiven because God made a way for our sins to be forgiven. Then tell the gospel story. And then after you've told the gospel story, say, uh, and that's why I know my sins are forgiven. And we can't stop there once we've shared the gospel. We must invite the person to respond with a decision. After telling the story, just say, does this story make sense to you? That we can't pay off our sins, but only God can make a way for our sins to be forgiven through Jesus? Then ask, do you believe that Jesus died to pay for our sins and rose from the dead and is Lord? If the person is open to the gospel, invite them to receive Christ, to invite their friends to study together and learn more. Mike Shipman, in his any 3 training material, uses the first and last sacrifice story as a way to share the gospel story. Uh, so right now I'm going to tell this entire story and then we'll talk about some of the details. I know my sins are forgiven and it's not because I'm a good person, although I do try to do good. I know my sins are forgiven because God himself has already made a way for our sins to be forgiven. Jesus, the Word of God, was in heaven with God from the beginning. Then Jesus was born into the world through the Virgin Mary. Even the Quran says this. Jesus never sinned. He once fasted 40 days and nights without eating anything. During this time, he was tempted in every way imaginable, yet he did not sin. He could overcome his passions, so he never married. He never killed anyone. He was born into a normal family, not rich or a religious hypocrite. He was an ordinary person like us. He cast out demons. He healed many people, including a person blind since birth, and he even raised the dead. It's interesting that although Jesus was not old yet, but he began prophesying to his followers, uh, saying, I must die and will rise again. Do you know why Jesus said, I must die? The answer is in the books of the law, the Torah. The law tells us about the first person, Adam, and his wife, Eve. In the beginning, God created Adam, and from his rib, God created his wife, Eve. God put them in a perfect paradise called the Garden of Eden. They were given the responsibility of taking care of the garden. They were also given great freedom to eat fruit from all of the trees of the garden except for the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God promised that if they ate that fruit, they would be punished severely. They would die. One day, the devil, in the form of a serpent, tempted Eve to eat the fruit that God had forbidden. Eve ate from the fruit, then she gave it to Adam, and he also ate from it. Suddenly, they were embarrassed and felt ashamed, so they made clothes from leaves to cover their nakedness. They were also afraid, so they hid from God. Then God, who was all-knowing, came to them and brought severe punishment. Eve would have difficulty in childbirth, and until now all women have the same problem. Adam would have difficulty working to make a living, and until now all heads of households are in the same predicament. God cast Adam and Eve out of the garden called Paradise, and they could never return. Finally they died. God's intention was for them to live forever, but because of sin they had to die. That's interesting because 
as far as we know, Adam and Eve were responsible good people, maybe better than us. We're not told in the scripture, but perhaps they had already done thousands of good works. However, as far as we know, how many times did Adam and Eve sin before God judged them? Just one time, and that was a small sin. They hadn't killed anyone, committed adultery, or stolen anything. They merely ate a fruit that God told them not to eat. Sometimes we think that if we do more good things than bad things, that our sins will be forgiven. But that's not what the Bible says. After judging Adam and Eve, God also judged the serpent, Satan, who had deceived them. God promised that a Savior, whom he had anointed, would be born of a woman's seed, would defeat Satan, and would suffer to redeem people from their sins. Many prophets over a period of hundreds of years promised the coming Savior, who would pay off our sin debt. God still loved the people that he created, so he made a way for their sins to be forgiven. God did something interesting. He changed their clothes. Formerly, they wore leaves for clothes. Do you know what kind of clothes God gave them? God replaced their clothes with animal skins. It appears that God himself offered the first sacrifice for the forgiveness of sins. The teaching of the Torah, Psalms, the Prophets, and the Gospel is that if there's no shedding of blood, sins are not forgiven. All of our forefathers offered blood sacrifices to have their sins forgiven. Adam and Eve, Abel and Noah, Abraham, Moses, David, etc. Then Jesus came, like I told you earlier. He was born of a virgin. That's interesting. Jesus was a woman's descendant. He lived sinlessly and performed great miracles. And one day a prophet named John said this about Jesus. Look, the Lamb of God, which takes away the sins of the world. That's interesting, isn't it? A person was called God's lamb. Why? Because a lamb is a sacrificial animal. That is why Jesus said, I must die. Jesus came to be God's sacrifice to pay off our sin debt. Therefore, Jesus surrendered himself to evil people. They crucified him and his blood poured out. Before Jesus died, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and died. Our sin debt was paid off. Then, Jesus came back alive on the third day after his death. He appeared to his followers for 40 days, then he was taken up into heaven. Someday, Jesus will return to the earth as judge over all mankind. The Bible tells us that if we surrender to Jesus as Lord and believe that he paid for our sins through his sacrifice and was raised from the dead, our sins will be forgiven. And that is why I know my sins are forgiven. So that's the story, the first and last sacrifice story, and has three basic parts. Part one, talking about, about basically who Jesus is and just a general overview of, of what he did. And then part two, talking about the Adam and Eve story, how they sinned and, and, and uh, God uh, made clothes for them. And then part three, talking about Jesus, death, and resurrection. Now when talking about talking uh, about about faith with Muslims, it helps to have some basic ideas about what Muslims generally believe. So we'll go through some of these in important topics and uh, just to highlight some some of the things that Muslims believe. Like, what do Muslims believe about God? Well, they believe that there is only one God. He's the creator of all things, that He is all-powerful and all-knowing. He's a merciful God, and He communicates with humans through revelations given to prophets. So, uh, sounds sounds all pretty good to us. One difference, though, uh, between Islam and Christianity is that God, God isn't someone who reveals himself. He doesn't reveal himself, just his will. He reveals his will through the prophets. And so uh, a God who reveals himself incarnate, this is not something that Muslims could accept. What do Muslims believe about Jesus? Well, they believe that Jesus is the son of Mary, the virgin, that he is 
uh, without sin. He's God's prophet, Messiah. Their, their understanding of Messiah is not, not a king or savior Messiah like we think of, but more like a prophet Messiah. Uh, he's prophet and priest, but not king. Uh, Jesus is actually one of the most mentioned people in the Quran. Uh, Muslims believe that he was raised to heaven and that he'll come again. Uh, and um, but, but the difference is that Muslims deny that Jesus died on the cross. They deny that Jesus is God incarnate. What do Muslims believe about the Bible? Well, there's, there's four Islamic holy books revealed by God, according to Muslims. The Torah, Psalms, the Gospel of Jesus, and Quran. But only the Quran is, is perfect and has not been corrupted. So the Christian books, the, what we call the Bible, the Muslims believe that this has been corrupted. What do Muslims believe about sin? Sin is any act against God's command. The, the worst sin is shirk, which is worshiping anything besides Allah. So this is, this is why Muslims, um, they are offended by Christianity, uh, thinking that it is, is worship of worship of a man and not worship of Allah. So um, besides, besides this one, some very serious sins according to Muslims are murder and adultery like we have in our Ten Commandments, uh, but also um, eating pork, drinking alcohol, and not following the five pillars of Islam. So this, this is like not saying the prayers, not fasting during Ramadan, not taking the pilgrimage to Mecca or giving alms. And another one of the most serious sins a Muslim could commit is cutting off the ties of a relationship, of a close relationship. So you can see how hard it would be for a Muslim to convert to Christianity if it means breaking the ties with their family. What do Muslims believe about forgiveness? One can be forgiven through genuine repentance. Those who repent, believe, and do good deeds, God will change their evil deeds uh, into good ones. So repentance is accepted if it's, in, if it's sincere. The Quran says, ask your Lord for forgiveness, then turn back to Him. He will overlook the bad deeds of those who have faith, do good deeds, and believe in what has been sent down to Muhammad. What do Muslims believe about sacrifices? That blood sacrifice can't replace the necessity of repentance. In order to be forgiven, you must be truly repentant, um, asking for forgiveness and then turning to good deeds. Uh, sacrifice, this is done to help the poor and to remember Abraham's willingness to sacrifice. So sacrifice has a different meaning in Islam. Now notice that what we would say is foundational is missing here. That Jesus' atoning sacrifice is absolutely necessary for our salvation. What do Muslims believe about judgment? On judgment day, God will weigh a person's good deeds and sins and punishes to hell those individuals whose sin outweighs their good deeds. Those who followed God's guidance will be rewarded with paradise. Every individual will carry their own burden and be judged for their own deeds. So clearly, this is a works-based religion that's contrary to the true gospel. In Christianity, we know it's by grace we are saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it's the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Ephesians 2, 8-9. 
Jesus took the penalty of sins on the cross, paid the price for our forgiveness. Now, if we go back to the first and last sacrifice story, we can see that, that even though the story that I told is very familiar to us, not much of it is strange at all, but, but if we look more carefully, we can see that it's especially contextualized for a Muslim audience. It's a story that's been crafted specifically for Muslims hearing the gospel for the first time with the Muslim worldview in mind. In part one, we talk about Jesus starting to say things that Muslims would all accept, that he was born of a virgin, that he was sinless, that he performed miracles. And, and, then, and we also mention things about Jesus that are clear differences with the prophet Muhammad. That Jesus never married, he never killed somebody, he never gathered riches, he performed great miracles, he healed the sick, he cast out demons, he raised the dead. And then finally, we say something a little uncomfortable for Muslims, but raises an important question that Jesus prophesied about his own death. Why? Why did he say that he must suffer and die? In part two, we tell the story of Adam and Eve, and through this story, we're introducing the themes of sin, judgment, and sacrifice. And notice how they're different than a Muslim's understanding. See, in Adam and Eve, in this story, disobeying God just once resulted in death. So apart from the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness for sins. And God promised through the prophets that a Savior would come who would take away sins. In part three, we tell the story of Jesus' sacrifice, his death, burial, and resurrection, and the meaning of it. The prophets, they help us to understand the meaning. At the beginning of Jesus' ministry, the prophet John called Jesus the Lamb of God, referring to the sacrifice accepted by God for our forgiveness. Now, Jesus came to be God's sacrifice to pay for our sins and die on the cross. This goes against Muslim uh, theology. God made a way for our sins to be forgiven through Jesus' death and resurrection. But what would a, what would a conversation look like? A witnessing encounter that followed the any three approach? Uh, well, this is what the whole conversation might look like uh, as an outline. Uh, these are following the five steps that we went over earlier. Uh, get connected, get to God, get to sin, get to the gospel, and get to decision. It starts by just by talking. Hey, meeting somebody, going up to somebody. Hey, where are you from? Uh, um, are, you, are you a Muslim? Uh, what re what religion are you? Getting to God. Most most religions are all alike, aren't they? We all want to please God. We all want to go to heaven. We're all trying to get our sins forgiven. And then uh, after talking about sin, then uh, uh, we're going to ask some questions. We all sin, don't we? Well, what do you do to get your sins forgiven? Are are your sins forgiven? When will your sins be forgiven? On Judgment Day, will you know that your sins are forgiven? And then after hearing from, from them about sin, you, you might share about what you believe is different. I believe differently. I know that my sins are forgiven, but it's not because I'm a good person. Of course, I try to be a good person. I know that my sins are forgiven because God has made a way for our sins to be forgiven. And then tell the gospel story. You might use the first and last uh, sacrifice story. Um, this makes sense, doesn't it? And then ask for a response. Do they, do they accept it? Do they believe it? Do you believe it? And uh, if so, you can, you can lead them to um, call on the name of Jesus for salvation. So here we just have these five basic transition sentences. And if you, if you want to 
uh, train yourselves in this method, then I recommend practicing these transition statements and mastering them. And if it's in your mind, you will feel comfortable knowing exactly how to get from one step to the next step. Well, this, this, this type of training really needs, needs time to practice and needs time to actually train with a training partner. If you want to uh, develop your, your skills on this method and, and become more effective at witnessing, whether it be to Buddhists, atheists, or Muslims, then I suggest you find a, a practice partner, a training partner, and go through some of these exercises together. First, explain the five steps of the NA3 approach to, to one another. What are the five steps? What are the, what are the five characteristics of Jesus' witnessing approach in the story of the w woman at the well? And then take turns practicing the transitions. Just go through those five transitions um, one by one. How to get from step one to two. How to get from step two to three. And then finally, take turns retelling the first and last sacrifice story. Use those three main parts, part one, two, and three, as your basic outline and the, the bullet points that I had for, for each one to, to guide you. You, uh, you don't have to tell it word for word exactly, but practice retelling the first and last sacrifice story. Um, I think there are uh, a few ways to use this, tr this training. One is to uh, know the transitions and know the sacrifice s story, but another is just to, uh, to know the basic approach. Get connected, get to God, get to sin, get to the gospel, and and get to decision, invite to invite for a decision or for follow-up. Finally, I want to share just a few resources that might be helpful to you if you want to learn more about witnessing to Muslims. Any three is the book by Mike Shipman that has all the material presented today and more explanation and examples. Seeking Allah, Finding Jesus by Nabil Qureshi is a book by a Muslim background believer that is a great introduction into what Muslims believe, how they think, and how they live out the customs and traditions of Islam. And it's a wonderful testimony of how he came to know Christ. The Prophet's story is another version of the first and last sacrifice story that does a very good job at presenting the gospel to Muslims, and it's a very well done video. It's a great video to watch together with your Muslim friends. and if. Uh, if you, you can't memorize the first and last sacrifice story, show them the video on your cell phone. Finally, PrayForHui.com is a website with a lot of good information about Chinese Muslim people groups and how to pray for them. If you'd like to talk with me more or partner together in prayer for Muslims, please contact one of the pastors who can put you in touch with me. Thank you for your partnership in the gospel. May God equip you and bless your work for his glory.